I'm Connor Rebush, and if you are interested in the finer points of face punching, you've come to the right place. This is Heavy Hands. Hello and welcome to episode 100, 100 emoji, 100 emoji, 100 emoji, episode 100 of the Heavy Hands Podcast, the only place for the finer points of face punching. I am your host, Connor Rebus, joined once again by Patrick Wyman. Pat, you've been doing this with me now for 80 episodes or something like that? Yeah, something crazy, man. We've been at this for a long time. Holy shit, has it been 80 episodes? I'm going to find out when the first episode you did was. But it's been a long time, and that's 100 total episodes. It would have been so perfect to have episode 100 be the show when we get to talk about Jones versus Cormier 2, the world's best light heavyweight against the world's light heavyweight champion. Uh, Rematch of what was already a fantastic fight with lots of drama and everything. Unfortunately, Daniel Cormier pulled out couple weeks ago, I guess uh, four weeks before the fight, three and a half weeks, something like that. Ovin St. Preux was one of the few elite light heavyweights on the roster not booked or recovering from dental surgery, I guess, is what uh, Anthony Johnson had going on. And so he stepped up to fight Jones. I'm not unhappy about this fight. It's not ideal, though I think it is interesting. Um, but we're going to try and give it the whole full heavy hands treatment, break it down over the course of this first segment, and... Um, Later on in the show, we're going to be talking about the other most intriguing fights of this card. The main card here for UFC 197 is absolutely stacked. Um, every single fight is very interesting. We're going to talk about four of them total. The main event, Jones versus St. Prue. After that, we're going to talk about Demetrius Johnson defending his flyweight title against Henry Cejudo. Likely the last interesting flyweight contender left on the roster right now, at least as, uh, in terms of ones DJ hasn't already beaten. And then we're going to give a little love to the fantastic, dynamic, explosive, knockout power-inducing striking battle between Anthony Pettis and Edson Barboza. And if we have time, a little bit on the middleweight matchup between Rafael Natal and uh, Robert Whitaker at the end. But first, let's do Jones versus St. Prue. Um, as I said, Pat... Not a bad replacement. I think that St. Prue, in a lot of ways, is kind of a cut-rate Anthony Johnson. Hmm. A A, cut-rate Anthony Johnson. A cut-rate. Now, now mind you, I mean really cut-rate. But here we we have from OSP, what do we got? We have good countering ability. We have heavy hands and kicks. And we have uh, the fact that he's a front runner (laughs) and that he doesn't do well later in fights when his opponent starts to fight back in a meaningful way. Um, so in a lot, I think he offers some of the same threats. He's, he's probably the second hardest hitting fighter in the division after Anthony Johnson. Yeah, I'm with that. I can, I can see the comparison that you're drawing here. Um, I just think we have to emphasize the extent to which he is very much not as good. Um, especially in terms of wrestling. Yeah. So, yeah, I think that's that's the biggest issue here. Yeah, but, yeah. So St. Pru is a tricky fighter. He's an awkward fighter. Um, he does some very interesting things. His game is weird, but it makes sense when you put all the pieces together. Mm-hmm. So he, he likes to operate at extreme range. Big southpaw, uh, big power, doesn't throw a whole lot of volume. Um, but he likes to circle. He likes to move. He likes to probe with his lead hand. He likes to throw these really sharp uh, front kicks to the body to keep you at the end of his range. Then uh, he, th- he follows those up with really sharp, hard left kicks. And then he likes to leap in. He likes to leap in with either a hard left kick uh, or a uh, or a really nice sharp straight left. And then. As he establishes this distance, it gives him the space either to leap in because he's going to be faster than you coming in. He's pretty sure of that. Or alternatively, it gives him enough space that as you come in on him, he can counter you. He's a really, you mentioned this, Connor, he's a really good counter puncher. He's a sharp counter puncher. He's got really good timing and he's really, really good at sneaking in shots around, uh, under and through it and kind of through your guard. It's a, 
it's a weird game, but it's all predicated on him setting this long distance and then either using his explosiveness to cover it or baiting you to come in so he can counter you. Yeah, I, I think that, aside from the wrestling, abil- wrestling ability, is maybe the biggest difference between OSP and a guy like Rumble. Rumble, we have characterized as an aggressive counterfighter. He he counters very well, but basically all of those counters come off of pressure. He is, at heart, a pressure fighter who, rather than swarming, likes to throw counter punches. OSP, I think, is maybe the division's most defined counterpuncher. He likes to set that long distance. He likes to have opponents overextended and, and coming at him so he can clock him with these these awkward looping shots. And then kind of like a super-powered Machida, he will pick you apart with body kicks and leg kicks and long shots at range until you leap in after him. The, the problem that OSP has is... There's a there's a very specific example in my mind, because he had some success early in his fight with Glover Teixeira. Um, was that his last fight? Uh, no, he has since oh, yes. uh, beat, badly beaten up uh, uh, Fei Zhao in a fight where he he actually injured himself early on. The weird fight with Fei Zhao, where Fei Zhao really didn't want to be there. Um, yeah, but in that Glover Teixeira fight, he had some success early. He knocked Teixeira off his feet with a body kick was even hard to tell if Tashera was hurt or not swarmed him with punches definitely stunned him in the in the ensuing barrage but there's a moment in that fight where after he has some success countering he ends the first two rounds fairly decently maybe in the sometime in the middle of the second round or in the beginning of the third Glover has St. Prue's back to the fence he's sitting there waiting to counter and then Glover faints and St. Prue drops his left hand all the way down to his hip, and he's ready with the uppercut. And he tenses up, and Glover's not coming in. And then Glover twitches again, and he, and he tenses up, and then he just gives up on it and shells up, and Glover gets in and takes him down. And I think that's the problem. Is like St. Prue is purely a natural counterfighter. There is not a lot of craft to the way that he forces those counters to happen. Yes, he'll hurt you at range and make it so that a lot of fighters who are less disciplined or less skilled will feel compelled to come in after him and do so recklessly. But really, if you have the ability to technically and safely, responsibly cover distance and um, and, and measure the distance between you and, and OSP, he doesn't really know how to make you throw the shots he wants to counter. And so yeah. he's, he's left doing a lot of waiting and a lot of hesitating when it starts to get difficult to find those openings. Yeah, I, I fundamentally agree with that. It is not a layered counter game. Um, it, yeah. it plays to his strengths. It plays to his speed. It plays to his power. It plays to his really excellent sense of timing. Um, it plays to his sense of space. He's got really good spatial awareness um, of how far he is from his opponent. Yeah. Like he is, he is a highly athletic fighter. I think we underutilize. I, I think we. It's easy to understate how good an athlete Ovin Saint Pru is. It's not that he's untrained, and he has put together a game that really suits his physical characteristics well. But it's a boom or bust game. Um, either he gets you, and he gets you early, or he's not going to get you. And it's kind of it's kind of that simple with him. It's not an efficient game. Um, it's not a game that it's not a game that has a lot of depth to it. It's definitely not efficient or deep. It's and that's the problem. We we've um, we recent when we did a Diaz versus McGregor, some people shouted at us about how we use the term athleticism. We should specify OSP, explosive athlete, not an endurance athlete. He is so reliant on his athleticism in the way that we typically use it, where these fast twitch muscle fibers, these quick explosive reactions generating tons of speed and power that he he pretty quickly exhausts himself. And he's proven in the past the ability to keep going after he's tired. Uh, he fought a five-round fight with Ryan Bader. He he did okay in, in terms of just man- managing to keep going and, and, and protecting himself and everything. Um, but... Because I think a lot of what makes him so dangerous is based on that athleticism, his power tends to fade pretty noticeably after his explosiveness starts to go away. He doesn't have a lot of good natural weight transfer on his shots. Like, it's all muscular power. And so when he does start to tire, basically everything that makes him effective goes away. He'll still be there, and he'll still he, – he can keep keep hitting you with shots, but if you know that you can take them – they're going to be slower and less impactful by far than they were in the first round or two. 
Yeah, I think we've talked about this before, but I draw a real distinction between athletic power and na- and what I would consider more like natural power sure. or kind of snapping power. Like, um, like Anthony Johnson has both. Anthony Johnson is the rare example of a fighter who has both natural power and athletic power. Uh, but Conor McGregor is like a sna- Conor McGregor has that snapping power. The difference is whether a guy looks like he's throwing hard or not. And Ovin St. Pru always looks, you can tell when he is throwing hard, mm-hmm. you know, because he gets his entire body into it, but it's not, a, it's not an efficient movement. Like, and the, uh, like, uh, like, I'm not sure that Ovin St. Pru, if you went through and you drilled him over and over and over and over again on perfect technique would actually be that hard of a puncher. You know what I mean? Yeah, maybe not. I, I, you know, who's a great example of natural power. We bring him up many times, but, uh, for MMA, Justin Gaethje. Yeah. Because mm-hmm. Justin Gaethje is dead tired after about three minutes because he fights at a ridiculous pace. He is often gasping before the first round is done, and he hits hard no matter how long you stay in the cage with him because he has good weight transfer, keeps his legs in good position, stays just low enough without spreading his legs out too far. He has good mechanical natural power. Uh, and a guy like OSP is so reliant on, on being fresh to hit hard and to be able to explode into his shots that, yeah, that, that power fades when his uh, his stamina starts to. So, obviously... Because there, there's, there's a difference between good weight transfer and getting all your weight into yes. your shots, which is what athleticism allows you to do. Yes. Like, yeah, I mean, so, like... A guy like McGregor, he gets his weight into his shots. He gets good weight transfer, but he doesn't have to throw. He doesn't have to physically throw himself into into those shots in order to generate it. Yeah, yeah. OSP would be a great long jumper, probably. You know, he can cover a lot of distance with one big movement, but um, it, that's not necessarily what you need to throw a good punch. Not necessarily. Yeah. Yeah. So, how do we think? Given that these are the basic outlines of Ovin St. Preux's game, and he's got he's got a nice technical double leg to go along with it. He's got some good setups for his double. Uh, like he against Krylov, he hit a really cool uh, like a body kick to a double leg entry that was really interesting. Mm-hmm. So he's got some creativity there. And on the mat, he's not a great control artist, but he has a really nice. Uh, he's got a really nice uh, like mat wrestling game. He's he's really good from the ride. He's good at sneaking in shots there. Yeah. But that's basically it. So he's got this really. He's got this basic but effective uh, striking game that plays off his strengths. Then he's got this wrestling game that, again, also plays off his athletic gifts. Um, None of it is particularly sustainable. How does this play out against John Jones, Connor? Before you said, how how do you, and I thought you were going to say, how do you think John Jones beats him? <laughs> because I think obviously both of us favor John Jones in this fight. It's difficult not to. I don't want to be too crazy, too, too strongly for John Jones. There's always a potential to get embarrassed if you're really going ride or die for a, a particular fighter. Uh, you're really going to bat for them because OSP hits hard and um, John Jones has not faced that many real power punchers. You never know. But uh, barring a, a freak collision between fist and face, it seems very, very likely that John Jones will beat Ovance St. Preux. I personally think this will be the long-awaited return of the Hellbows. I think we're going to get to see some of John Jones' ground and pound that because of the wrestling ability of his opposition for the last, let's see, he hasn't got to beat someone up on the ground since Chael Sonnen. Um a fight that I don't like thinking of because it makes me remember John Jones's toe. But uh, Alexander Gustafson, Glover Teixeira, Daniel Cormier, all of these guys who are good enough wrestlers that John Jones couldn't control them on the ground. Owen St. Preux uh, very recently was controlled pretty effectively on the ground by Glover Teixeira, who is probably not as good a control wrestler as John Jones. And so I think we're going to see John Jones ultimately, we can talk more about how he gets there, but ultimately I think he will end up finishing OSP with ground and pound. Yeah, I think that's uh, that's a pretty reasonable conclusion. I think either he will have his pick of ways to finish this fight on the ground once we get into the third or the fourth round. Um, it could be interesting early, but again, you know, St. Preux relies on setting this incredibly long range. I could see him giving Jones some trouble leaping in and out with shots, but eventually Jones is going to stick him on the end of his even longer range. And Jones is yeah. going to be ever sharper in the exact spaces where St. Preux wants to operate, but with better, but with better ring craft, better understanding of the space of the cage and, and more uh, effective backup plans that yeah. when St. Preux leaps in with a shot, 
Jones will just step inside it, grab a hold of him, and then they're in the clinch. Then they're in Jones's world, and St. Prue does not have a ton to offer there. Yeah, and the thing that Jones has been improving at, um, most notably over the last couple of years, and I, I can't imagine that they will they'll they will have regressed at all. I imagine he'll be a little sharper, even G- given the kind of pad work we've seen him doing with Brandon Gibson on Twitter and Instagram. He seems to be continuing to work on the things that have visibly improved recently. So those things are uh, cage craft, his footwork, his sense of space, um, the way that he creates distance and how and when he decides to take it away on his own terms. He's a lot more comfortable moving both directions, all four, all six directions, however you want to view it and, and really taking control of the distance rather than just constantly trying to create it. And um, he's also gotten a lot better defensively, he um, does a really good job now. John Jones does a really good job of moving his head in the pocket um, a lot better than he used to be. Uh, if you recall the Alexander Gustafson fight, John Jones was like the most awkward man on the planet when it came to fighting in mid-range with Alexander Gustafson. By the time the Glover Teixeira fight rolled around and the Daniel Cormier fight as well, John Jones so much more comfortable keeping a nice tight guard in close, using that hand positioning to work short punches and hard elbows and covering up his ears while he rolls under the counter hooks and, and, and shots of his opponents, pulling to create space, really using the whole breadth of movement available while in his stance while still staying in front of his opponent. So that makes him really effective as a, uh, a pressure fighter when he's forcing his way forward. And he's gotten better at feinting his way in, too. I think all of these things are are kind of a, ultimately a death knell for OSP, who, who, despite having some good moments against some good fighters, like he had some nice moments against Gegard Mousasi. Um, he beat – he had some good moments against Bader – and he was very impressive in the way he beat Cummins, and he showed grit against Cavalcante and had some good moments against Teixeira, despite having flashes of of, of goodness. I don't want to say greatness necessarily or brilliance, but having good flashes throughout his recent career, he just doesn't have the depth of skill that a guy like John Jones has in all areas. And again, that's only speaking of the striking which is the most even this fight can be. Because really on the ground, in terms of being controlled, all OSP has is explosion. And that doesn't last for long. You know, like OSP is happy to lay on his back in half guard. That's how undeveloped his his technical ground game is. Yeah, I mean, I, I couldn't disagree. I couldn't uh, disagree with Excuse anything. Excuse me? That you you that couldn't you disagree more? I can't. <laughs> no, I can't really disagree with 70, 77 episodes. And, and this is how you treat me. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, I think you're crap. Con. <laughs> that, should, that should be clear by now. <laughs> it has been 77, by the way. I double checked it. Episode oh, 23 was the first one you did with me. God, 77 times we've done this. Crazy. But yeah, no, I mean, I, I generally I, I, I agree with pretty much all of that. I, I think that OSP falls into that category of former wrestlers who are happy to scramble with you on the mat, but uh, that doesn't play as well in MMA for, for fairly obvious reasons, yeah. because there are more ways in MMA of establishing control on the mat. And yeah. that has gotten OSP in trouble in, in a lot of ways. But like, yeah, I mean, he just does not have the depth of skill to be able to compete at Jones with range for very long. Not even really in the pocket. OSP isn't even really a pocket fighter. No. And God forbid he does want to go there. I don't think he has the technical acumen necessary to break away from Jones and maintain that range to stay out of the clinch where Jones is undoubtedly the better fighter. So yeah, yeah, when you put all those things together, I think Jones will probably get hit a couple of times. He's probably not going to like it very much because OSP hits real hard, but Jones will eventually settle in. He'll find his distance. He'll find his, uh, he'll find his timing. He'll pile up volume to the legs and body of St. Prue, and when St. Prue tires, as he inevitably will, as he inevitably will, Jones is going to take him down in impressive fashion and beat the crap out of him from the top. Yeah. Now let's talk about um, briefly before we move on to our next segment. Let's talk about Jones's wrestling because we mentioned it as being a strong advantage for him here. Um, I think Jones has resharpened his wrestling. Didn't look so good in that Alexander Gustafson fight. I do not think he expected Alexander Gustafson to be that good at defending takedowns. And uh, also, I, I think we all know at this point that he was pretty poorly prepared for that fight overall, like was barely training. Um, since then, in the, both the Teixeira fight and especially in the Cormier one, I think he has resharpened his wrestling skills. He is not the kind of wrestler that has um, been able to take OSP off his feet regularly. I don't know that John Jones is, for example, 
a fantastic uh, explosive double leg kind of wrestler with that those great shot reactive takedowns. Um, so how do you see him implementing his wrestling game against OSP? So I think a couple of things, uh, a couple of things there. What we've seen in his last few camps is Jones working with a much higher caliber of training partner when he's working on his wrestling. So for the Cormier, so for the first Cormier fight, he brought in Ed Ruth, who is an absolutely outstanding wrestler, uh, national champion at Penn mm-hmm. State, uh, very nearly made the U.S. freestyle team, uh, and is not, is about to make his uh, his debut in Bellator, I think, this year. Oh, uh, yeah, Bellator yeah. signed him. So that's who he brought in for the first fight. Obviously, that's an incredibly high-caliber wrestler. For this fight, to fight Cormier the second time, he brought in Yoel Romero to work with, uh, yeah. who is, in a lot of ways, a very similar wrestler to Cormier. Um, so, and he, in a lot of ways, a very similar striker to OSP. Yeah, actually, yeah, it's not a, that's not a bad comparison at all. So he's got the right sparring partners, he's got the right training partners. Um, but with regard to Jones's game, I think he he likes to do one of two things. In open space, he likes to take you down from the clinch. He likes to work his trips. He likes to work his throws. He likes to work his lateral drops. Mm-hmm. Um, he's got he's got a lot of depth and variety to that. Against the fence, though. I think he's very happy to, to, to work shot takedowns on you. Yeah. And if he can steer OSP there, as I think he'll be able to do, um, I think he'll be able to take, uh, I think he'll be able to take OSP down pretty much as he wills. But yeah. my guess in this case, I would think that he hits an inside trip. That's, that's going to be my guess. Sounds about right. Or, or a foot sweep. I can see. Do you remember the uh, foot sweep he hit? It was actually, I think pretty much the same one he hit. Um, against Shogun when they fought. He hit it against Daniel Cormier against the fence at the end of the fourth round, and and then he stood for like three more seconds with his palm on Cormier's forehead holding him down. Yep. God. <laughs> Did you see the Did you see the vine I tweeted out of Jones uh, the of Jones doing the DX chop to the set to break it down? <laughs> no, I didn't. But yeah. that is that is John Jones. Just just a, a cold blooded. And yet strangely immature motherfucker. But I'm really excited to see him back. Um, I'm excited to see if OSP can test him. I want to see how Jones... I think it, it is, it is, if nothing else, a nice way for Jones to get a tune-up fight before Daniel Cormier. And then hopefully OSP can serve as a sort of warm-up for what to expect when uh, hopefully John Jones fights Anthony Johnson down the line. So it should be interesting from a few perspectives. But really I think the best matched fight on this card is the one we're going to be talking about next. After this break, we're going to come back and talk about Demetrius Johnson, the only flyweight champion in UFC flyweight history, versus Henry Cejudo, Olympic gold medalist, and uh, one of the most interesting challengers to the flyweight throne we've seen yet. Hey, everybody. Thanks for listening to this week's Heavy Hands. If you like what you hear, please consider pledging to support the podcast on Patreon. Patreon is basically continuous crowdfunding. You sign up to contribute a certain amount per month to help us with production costs and the like. And in return, you get rewards ranging from a mention on the Heavy Hands website to a question or topic of your choice being discussed on the show. We have a lot more in the works to reward you for your help, and we appreciate every contribution. No amount is too small. Just head over to patreon.com and find how you can help out the only show dedicated to the finer points of face punching. Now let's get back to it. And we are back. Um, Now, as I said before the break, this is probably the most deserving fight on the card, the most deserving matchup of your attention. I know there are a great deal of you out there who... Couldn't care less about Demetrius Johnson. The division hasn't been around that long, and it takes a while for new divisions to gain traction. He's small, and I guess some of the uh, more boastful of you out there feel like you could beat him up in a bar, even if most of you are almost certainly wrong. Um, There's all these reasons that people have that they don't care about a guy like Demetrius Johnson. He's not a a dynamite puncher or uh, like an immediate finishing threat, although obviously you guys care about guys like Khabib Nurmagomedov, so I don't know why that is suddenly a, an important criterion when Demetrius Johnson becomes a factor. Anyway, I get it. You're not all that interested in Demetrius Johnson all the time. Pat and I are going to try to convince you that uh, Demetrius Johnson versus Henry Cejudo is probably the best matchup on this card in terms of a deserving title challenger, um, interesting layered games, a, a, a fascinating style clash of two very different and yet two very similar uh, fighters. And so... The way we're going to try to look at this matchup is 
the, our our archetype for this, uh, our architecture for this, is the idea of connections or linkages. So we talk about transitions a lot on this show. The 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 spaces between phases and between ranges, between elevations, when a guy is changing levels, or when the distance is opening or closing, or when you are transitioning from a takedown to top control, or from the outside to the clinch. These little moments. Um, or from offense to defense is a very important one. These little moments where you're transitioning from doing one thing to doing something else uh, is what allows fighters like Demetrius Johnson or like Khabib Nurmagomedov or like John Jones to appear to be one step ahead of their opponents so frequently when they're in fights because they're very good in those spaces. And so we're going to look at the way that DJ and Henry Cejudo differ in terms of the, the ways that their games are connected. And Pat, I'll let you jump in first. We're going to talk about Henry Cejudo. You think that there is one very distinct connection that he does really well. Yeah, I think that Cejudo's game is built on two things. Uh, first and foremost, it's built on explosive forward movement, that he is all about moving forward. Pretty much the entirety of his game is based on that. Yeah. Um, so he's going to leap in with a punch, uh, with a punch or two, with a kick. Uh, he's going to dive in on a takedown. But... What's important to note there, and this is the second thing that Cejudo does, is his entire game is built on that either that forward movement, getting into his punches, or getting into the clinch. If he overshoots on his punches, he's going to grab a hold in the clinch, where he's almost certainly got better technique than you. He's almost certainly stronger than you. He's mm-hmm. really, really, really excellent at, gra- at punching his way right into an underhook, which is a weird thing to be able to punch your way directly into, but it's the transition that he has mastered more than anybody else. It's why he always seems to be a step ahead of his opponents in those phases. It's why they never seem to be able to get takedown attempts on him, to be able to get in on his hips, uh, to even really be able to do much damage to him in the clinch. It's because he always has that underhook, and he's always stronger. He can always elevate you. So that's the transition that Cejudo has mastered, not punching into takedown attempts, um, not punching into terribly damaging work in the clinch, but that's his safety blanket. It's his ability to go straight from punches into the clinch. It's his ability to use those clinch entries as counters um, if you come in on him. He doesn't really have a, much of a counter punching game aside from one or two uh, aside from one or two spots that he's shown. But he's really good at you at letting over aggressive opponents know that if they come in on him, he's going to grab a hold, and then they're not going to be able to get anything done, nothing yeah, at all. Yeah, I, I agree with you, and I think it's that that one connection is what makes this fight so interesting as a stylistic matchup. Because here we have Henry Cejudo, the Olympic gold medalist in freestyle wrestling, obviously a fantastic wrestler, just doesn't do a lot of offensive wrestling in terms of finishing takedowns and controlling opponents on the ground, but is a dominating force in the clinch, very difficult to control or take down himself. I think he's so. F- I think he still has a hundred percent takedown defense in the UFC. Yeah, um, has never been taken down in an MMA fight. Period. Right, and and so he's he's obviously very good at the wrestling, and that is often the tool that Demetrius Johnson has had to go to to beat his opponents. He's kind of become renowned as this excellent clinch fighter. And if we're talking about connections, the clinch itself is kind of like a prolonged transition. Uh, I I like to think of it like its own phase, but the clinch is kind of the connection between striking and grappling. It is the connection between standing and the ground, where a fighter like Demetrius Johnson or Henry Cejudo can threaten both takedowns and a variety of strikes all at once, you know, and so they have all of these different tools that they can potentially turn to, and they have to worry about all those things as well. So it's kind of uh, a transitional fighter's dream. A fighter with a lot of connections is almost bound to enjoy fighting in the clinch, and I think that's why we've seen that from Demetrius Johnson. He enjoys being that step ahead of his opponent. He enjoys having his opponent reacting to him, but how does he deal with a fighter like Henry Cejudo, who's probably bigger and stronger, um, doesn't seem to have had any stamina issues despite the brutal weight cut and uh, is obviously an incredibly skilled wrestler. How does that matchup play out? I think that's what makes this so fascinating. Um, yeah, I think that's that's fundamentally it, right? Because how does Demetrius Johnson win a fight where at least probably in the first round or two, he's not going to be able to take Cejudo down and where he's going to be facing a guy who is probably the most technically sound and strongest clinch fighter that he's faced? Do you think that's safe to say? Yeah, and one of the most, probably actually also the highest volume fighter he's faced at flyweight in terms of like, mm-hmm. Cejudo is going to come forward and throw more strikes Demetrius Johnson than anybody else. Um, so, yeah, so how is Johnson going to react to that when his preferred transitions into the clinch and, and directly into his wrestling are probably going to be nullified, at least at the beginning? Like, that's, that's what makes this an interesting fight. I mean, I think, 
as the fight goes on, as Johnson collects more and more information, as he's able to note what Cejudo does to react in response to what Johnson throws at him, then Johnson is going to is going to find his openings. He's going to find his spots to put things together. But at least for the first couple of rounds, I think it's going to be a really, really hard fight for him. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, and I, I, before we move on f- fully to Demetrius Johnson and talking about how he might strategize for this, I want to talk about the one connection that stands out to me that is missing from the game of Henry Cejudo. And it's one that I mentioned before, one that you mentioned in passing. You said that Henry Cejudo doesn't really counterpunch. And it's true. I think the biggest gap in Henry Cejudo's game right now, the biggest transition that he is missing is that from defense to offense. I think he really, really struggles to defend himself while he's attacking. And I think he really struggles to attack when he is put on the defensive. Does that read to you? Does that scan? Yeah, absolutely. That's why he relies so much on the clinch, right? Is because it sure. allows him to avoid those spaces entirely. He can blanket like, you rather than having to avoid your punches and respond. Yeah, exactly. It's uh, it's it, it is his safety blanket. It's how he masks uh, his inexperience as a striker. Like he is a much more advanced offensive striker than defensive striker. There's yes. real craft to what he does offensively in terms of his ability to probe with his jab. Uh, to set a rhythm with his jab, like much more so than guys who have only been fighting as a pro in MMA for three years. Yeah. Like Cejudo does some tricky things with his feints too. He's got really good timing. You can see the potential there for him as a striker, but it's all offensive. There's almost no head movement, and what and what there is, it's like the old school Rashad Evans, where he would move his head at range, and then as soon as he got into a yes. range where his opponent could actually hit him, the head movement stopped. Or like Cejudo Shogun Hua. That. Shogun Hua is the same way. You have yeah. this little Mike Tyson imitation happening when you're five feet away, but once you're three feet from your opponent, you're just standing stock still, winging both hands. I, I, yeah, it's, I, he absolutely has that. I think that's the, the the biggest thing you can say, like the, the broadest correct statement you could make about Henry Cejudo is that he is very, very good offensively and that that is his real strength. And that when you start to look at the defensive aspects of his game as a mixed martial artist, he's not quite as good. I think... Um, Cejudo chains offensive techniques together really well. In that regard, he's a great transitional fighter. But, you know, whether it's it's changing the distance of his strikes, going from punches to kicks or from punches to knees when the opponent does a level change, punching into the clinch, as you said, threatening the wrestling and landing punches, things like that, um, using the jab to set up his other punches. He's very good at playing different threats off of each other, but he is not good at responding to threats with offense of his own. And and I think that's probably Demetrius Johnson's biggest opening in this fight. Demetrius Johnson is not a great defensive fighter. Um, He's not a defensive virtuoso by any means. He has gotten, he tends to get by more on speed rather than defensive craft, but he has gotten better bit by bit. And I think he is absolutely more comfortable playing with range and drawing things out of his opponent so that he can respond to them. I think that's going to have to be his solution to Henry Cejudo early on is maybe even to play against type a little bit and 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 move around on the outside the way he did to John Dodson in the first rounds of both of their fights. Try to bring Cejudo forward and open him up for some of those clinch entries, um, especially in that last fight against Dodson, too. Um, I think Johnson really showed some improved boxing, some really tricky feints to set up his lead right hand in particular. And I think that that kind of thing is going to be great against Cejudo because if he can get Cejudo jumping and and flinching and worrying about his defense with those quick popping strikes, then he can start to lower Cejudo's volume and only then can he really start to take over this fight. Yeah, would you Would you say it's fair to say about Johnson that rather than responding to his opponent's offense with defense, he replies with another kind of offense? Yeah, yeah. I think that's fair. Do you you have a couple examples? I mean, obviously a reactive takedown comes to mind, but what what are you thinking? Yeah, no, the reactive takedown, I think, is the quintessential example of that. So if you try to – so if you throw a punch at Johnson, rather than slipping his head off the center line, his response is much more likely to be shooting for a takedown or uh, even just dropping down – even just dropping down and and jumping into the clinch with you as an offensive technique. like. Um, or let's see, if you shoot a takedown on him, his response is going to be to try more to try and knee you in the face than to immediately necessarily try to uh, try to defend the take. Yeah, or even when he feels that he's being taken down, there's a sequence that stands out in my mind from his rematch with John Dodson, where Dodson gets him down early in the second round, and he immediately wraps up a sort of uh, 
calf across the face arm bar from guard immediately starts threatening an arm bar or potentially a go-go plata for to get his, get his other leg in control. He he ties up Dodson's arm and starts threatening him and Dodson has to pull out and that allows Demetrius Johnson to be the quick flighty thing that he is and spring back to his feet. So yeah, I, I, I think that's a pretty good read actually. Demetrius Johnson is more keen to respond with some kind of counter offense than he is to really defend himself. I do think he's gotten a little better at actually, you know, moving his head, moving his feet in the right directions and keeping his feet under him when he does move. I think that has enhanced both his defense and his offense. He's he's less susceptible to being hurt than he was in the past, less susceptible to being knocked off balance because he's not off balance very often anymore, and he is more likely to hurt you when he lands a shot because he has his feet under him like we were talking about with Justin Gaethje before. He's got much better striking mechanics built in, so that, that really makes the most of the speed and all of that that he already has. I think yeah. one of the best things you can say for Demetrius Johnson is that between the two John Dodson fights, because that's the last example we have of him, they both went very similarly, but in the second fight, Demetrius Johnson did not get hurt. Very similar pattern. He had to contend with Dodson's takedown defense early, the fact that he couldn't get him off his feet. He had to worry about his heavy left hand. He had to worry about getting hit on his way into the clinch and all of that, but he didn't absorb three knockdown punches like he did the first time. He he had the same pattern, and it went much easier for him. It was a lot, it was a lot um, kinder to him as a fighter. Yeah, like so with regard to Johnson's transitions, it's important to note that like while he is skilled in every phase, he's got a great double leg takedown. Um, he's got he's got a re- that really sharp right hand that we talked about. He's a, he's very good on top. He's got a really nice arm bar that he that like you pointed out, he can hit both from guard. He can hit that from the top too. Like he has these individual moves at which he is exceptionally technically skilled, but none of his skill sets by themselves are all that deep. Like if you were to if you were to put Demetrius Johnson on a wrestling mat with Henry Cejudo, that would not be a competitive match. If you were to put him into a striking matchup with, uh, or, or even like if you were to put him in a wrestling match with Ali Bagautinov, I think Bagautinov would have thrashed him. Hmm. Like um, because I don't think he has a lot of necessarily has a ton of depth of skill in any one phase. But the thing is, Demetrius Johnson is never going to play you on in an individual skill set on an even basis. He's never going to engage in a 50-50 match with you. He's never going to rest, just wrestle with you. He's never going to just strike with you. He's never going to just clinch with you. Every single time Demetrius Johnson is in one of those phases, it's on his terms, which always makes him one step ahead of you. He doesn't start his takedowns. He doesn't start his takedowns shooting and telegraphing them from open space. He throws a strike that allows him to get in on your hips, and from there he can finish that ultra technical, beautiful double leg. It's not that at, when he's at when he's at range with you, all you have to worry about is that popping straight right hand. It's the feint that says, "Oh, am I going to change levels and try and take you down first? Am I going to dive forward into the clinch?" All of those are things you have to worry about. Mm -hmm. When he's in the clinch, you don't just have to worry about his double collar tie. You also have to worry about him reaching down, grabbing a single, and then elbowing you in the face. Like The threat of each of these things makes his skill sets worth more than the sum of their parts as technical technical things. Yeah, that's a very good point. I I haven't really thought about it that way. I'm trying to think if there are any other dominant champions who have been that way. I wonder if maybe George St. Pierre was another fighter who was not particularly deep in any one phase, but was really good at stringing them together. Yeah, I think GSP's wrestling stands out to me as a skill set that was that was really deep, and his top game, too. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. But but as a striker, I think over the course of his career, GSP might actually have regressed a little bit. You think so? In order to, Yeah, I think he may have regressed a bit as a striker while getting better as a technical wrestler and as a mm. technical grappler. He got pretty good at the end there. I think the Johnny Hendricks fight, despite the fact that he was like not physically capable, was one of his better technical striking performances. Well, let me uh, let me. Uh, <laughs> I, know, let I know we're getting off track here. A bit. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so I think he got really good at at a, a couple of very limited, very particular things as a striker that allowed him to mask the fact that like that skill set in and of itself was not was not incredibly broad. Like, I think that skill set was deep, but I don't think that it was broad in the sense that it would have allowed him to just strike with an elite striker. Okay, so let's talk about, let's go back to Demetrius Johnson then, because that brings up an interesting point. Let's try to address the the notion of depth or, or breadth or however you want to phrase it of a skill set. What does it mean when you say that a fighter has a, is particularly deep or has a, has a lot of options in one skill set. Like, say, if you say Demetrius Johnson has a lot of depth to his striking, 
even though I know you don't believe that, what, what would it mean for you to say that? So that he has a lot of different technical approaches that he can bring to bear on, on sets of problems, that, um, that he has a lot of different techniques that he can utilize when he needs to, has a lot of different applications to which he puts those. Like, I don't think that Demetrius Johnson is an outstanding counterpuncher. Um, I don't think that he could play off the back foot if he really had to against somebody who was bound and determined to pressure him. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't think that he could uh, that he could play a kind of a circular movement based game if he had to. Um, I think that he's really really good in straight lines in that phase. I think he's very good at the particular things that he wants his striking to do for him. Like okay. and that's what I that that's what I mean when I say I think that it's yeah. that it's limited. I think he's very good at the particular things that he wants to do. But if he were forced out of that game, I don't know how good he would be at it. And, and so it's, it's not just um, it's not just a matter of number of techniques. It's also a matter of flexibility of those techniques. Like Demetrius Johnson, obviously he can throw a lot of techniques. He's he's very athletic, and he can he can probably throw any technique you want him to throw. But there's not a ton of depth in the way that he applies them as a fighter. Like, he's not going to have a hundred different uses for his jab. Or as George Benton once said, Demetrius Johnson is not about to go out there and demonstrate 48 counters to the jab. He's not about to have all of these different ways of responding to a problem. But what he does have is depth to his overall game. And so when he is answering you with his striking, what he's really thinking about is all the other ways he can exploit what your what his strikes are causing you to do, rather than just thinking about how he can continue to um, improve the success his strikes are having. Yeah, precisely. Like that's what I say when I mean that I think his overall game is worth more than the sum of its individual yeah. parts. Yeah. Um, because that, it, like, and so we've talked about this before in the past with prospects like Sage Northcutt, where their game is all connective tissue. That, mm-hmm. that the transitions are the connective tissue that binds together your different skill sets. Like, I'm not saying that, that Demetrius Johnson has Sage Northcutt's lack of, uh, lack of depth of skill as a, no. as a grappler or a wrestler or whatever, but, I, but like, the connective tissue between, the, uh, between those skill sets that may, not ha- that may not be specialized in any individual way is strong enough that it, may, that it makes all of those things so much better than they would be on their own. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, well, uh, final question then, final topic for us to discuss before we move on. Do you think Demetrius Johnson is a pressure fighter? I wouldn't have said so a while ago, but now I kind of think that he is because he's so it, he uses the fence so well. He kind of he kind of pressures whenever he seems like he's actually having his way in the fight, doesn't he? Yeah, like he can do other things. He can he can move out of the way at range, but really he is happiest when he is moving forward and pushing your back towards the fence. Yeah, I mean you look at both of the John Dotson fights, for example. The first one in particular, uh, we talked about how Demetrius Johnson's not a great counter puncher. He doesn't have all that depth, and, and I think I agree with you to his striking game, and and um, he doesn't have a lot of answers. And so, especially in that first John Dotson fight, we have him struggling to compete and struggling to look for these takedowns. And in both fights, even though he struggled less in the second one, in both fights, the solution was when he found the way to close the distance and control Dodson's body against the fence. Likewise, the big shots that he landed on Chris Cariasso in the second round, uh, at the end of the first round of their fight, came while Cariasso was moving backwards and being pushed towards the fence. There was a big right hand from Johnson, and then he transitioned into a beautiful knee that snapped Cariasso's head back. He landed a pretty brutal head kick on Bagatinov while pushing him back. Joseph Benavidez was knocked out while his back was to the fence after he kind of whiffed on a strike, had a bit of a, of a brain fart, I guess, and Demetrius Johnson fainted his way inside and, and shut his lights out. So, yeah, I, I kind of think so. I, I kind of think that... Um, and like you, I don't. I wouldn't have said this a while ago, but because he is such an all rounder and all the things that he is capable of doing, but I kind of think that given the preference, the thing that Demetrius Johnson is really good at is pressuring his opponent and forcing reactions. Yeah, yeah, I, I'm kind of with that. Like it's it's interesting. You don't think of a guy who can do all of the different things that Johnson can do as a pressure fighter. But what's the but the commonality in all of that is how well he uses the fence and how well he forces his opponent to the fence. Yeah. And I guess by our definitions, that would make him a pressure fighter by nature, if not necessarily by trade. Well, and it also gels with what we were saying before. It makes sense that he might have a pressure fighter's mentality, given the the fact that he's always looking for 
that he's always in in that connective tissue. He's always looking for ways to connect different aspects because I, I think Demetrius Johnson is very used to fighting as a very quick fighter. I think he'll probably always be the faster fighter, and by the time he isn't the faster fighter than his opponent, um, he will probably have so much depth that has been developed in his game that he'll be able to compete regardless with what speed he does have left. But I don't think he's particularly comfortable when he has to go on the defensive fully. I don't think he likes having to react to you second to second. I think he likes when the opponent is reacting to him, responding to his speed, and uh, opening themselves up for all of the different options that he has to apply. So it makes sense that if he's always looking to transition from one phase to the other, one distance to the other, one type of strike or one type of attack to the other, that he would like to pressure. Because when you're pressuring an opponent, you have them reacting to you. You kind of have them in the palm of your hand, you know, as, as far as applying the full breadth of your game goes. So I, I think that kind of, those two things kind of gel. Yeah. yeah, I'm with that. I'm with that. All right. Well... Final predictions, I guess. We already predicted John Jones over Ovin St. Pru. Um, predictions for this fight, I think I will give it to Demetrius Johnson, but I am really interested to see how he ends up making his game work against Henry Cejudo. I just think he has more depth as a mixed martial artist than Henry Cejudo does yet, and I think the fact that Cejudo's offense and defense can't really comfortably coexist, that, that marriage is weak at best, Um I think that is going to end up being his death now, but I think the first two rounds in particular are going to be really interesting. Yeah. I think unless Cejudo finishes early and at this point, while Cejudo has good athlete power and he's pretty, and he's pretty efficient with it, with all of that. I don't think that I've seen that Cejudo is the kind of puncher who's going to really trouble Demetrius Johnson early. That no. he's the kind of guy who can just get him out of there with a shot or two. Uh, so that to me says that while Cejudo may have some success, may win around, will probably take Demetrius Johnson down. Actually, that mm-hmm. would not surprise me at all. Um, I think he takes at most one round. I think we're looking at a forty-nine, forty-six decision for Demetrius Johnson, and potentially a frightful pounding late if he does get Cejudo figured out. Yeah, especially because we don't know how Cejudo looks in rounds four and five. I said he hasn't looked particularly gassed considering all of the horror stories we hear about how difficult his weight cut is the fact that he he's even had a bantamweight fight in his ufc career already because he couldn't make the flyweight limit but um he seems to recover from it okay but you still you can't count on a guy with his kind of output going five rounds until you've seen it so i think the chances that demetrius johnson has um has a, a a banner pair of rounds in the championship rounds is fairly high yep yeah, I mean, this This strikes me, while it's an interesting matchup and, and Demetrius Johnson is going to have to find interesting ways to impose his game, it, this will look like a Demetrius Johnson fight. Yeah, but everyone should learn to enjoy those. <laughs> Not to be a snob, but you got to love what the man does. He is arguably the best fighter on the planet right now. Only other man in that conversation really is uh, John Jones. So... Two of the best on the planet fighting this weekend. I think that's more than enough of a selling point for this card. But there's more. After this break, we're going to talk about the fight that may actually have me most excited as far as matchups go. Demetrius Johnson, I think, deserves the most praise, and his fight with Henry Cejudo is the best matchup in terms of relevance and and stylistic clash. But holy hell am I excited to see Anthony Pettis and Edson Barboza go at it. And we're going to talk about that one next, as well as Hafal Natal versus Robert Whitaker. Financial support is fantastic, but there are other, even easier ways to support heavy hands. Perhaps the best is by spreading the word. We know our fan base. You're all cool, popular people with serious social media presences. You're tastemakers and trendsetters. Okay, there are one or two of you that don't fit that description. You know who you are. But no matter what, you can always help us out by telling folks about the show. And you can also give us a positive rating and review on iTunes and Stitcher, things like that. We rely on word of mouth and positive feedback to grow and improve. So thank you very much for your time and your help. Now, back to the show. And before we get into our final two fight breakdowns of this episode, episode 100, by the way, still excited about that. I got to thank a few people who supported Heavy Hands, and I'm sure many of these people have been supporting Heavy Hands ever since that episode 23 when Pat first joined the show and this thing really got off the ground. Um, Those people are Owen, Alex, Chris Reaney, Carl Calmer, Chris Duncan, I Like Things, Axel Holt, 
and Jorge Cabrera. Thank you very much, guys. All of those people pledged $5 or more to Heavy Hands on Patreon. We really appreciate the support. And um, $5 or more, submit your questions and everything. We do really want to try to get that $10 reward of a discussion forum going. I'm not sure as of right now of how to actually make the one I set up on the Heavy Hands website function, but maybe we'll end up doing like a private Slack channel or something. That might be a better way of, of fostering discussion with our listeners, because I would really like to give you guys a chance to ask us questions and maybe like discuss fight events while they're happening live with Pat and I. You can you can interact with us and um, and and maybe contribute some ideas for next week's episode. We can all discuss things like that. And that would be, I think, a great way for us to thank you for your support. I know we have a few ten dollar donors who and twenty dollar donors who are not yet getting in touch with us in that in that way. And, and we will work it out soon. Um, anyway, Edson Barboza, Anthony Pettis, two lightweights, two very dynamic fighters, two powerful and accurate and well-rounded strikers, two guys who are, despite some grappling proclivities, probably not going to spend very much of this fight on the ground. And it's an absolutely outstanding matchup from an action perspective, from a stylistic matchup perspective. I am so excited to watch this fight. Yeah, this is this is awesome. This is the barn burner of the card. It's almost like you can pretty much pencil it in right now for fight of the night. Mm. Um, these guys are going to be walking away with some money. But interestingly enough, um, I think we have both uh, we are both picking the underdog here. Is that correct, Connor? Yeah, you came here today expecting to have a nice um, punch counter punch segment for us where we could argue for opposite fighters. But we we both, uh, <laughs> without having discussed it beforehand, said that we were kind of favoring Edson Barboza. Yeah, I think I think we are, and there are good reasons for this. Some of which have to do with Barboza himself, and I think others of which probably have to do with Pettis and what we see in his game. Yeah, and can I say because a lot of what we're going to say going forward, um, because we will probably be kind of making our case for the prediction we've both already settled on. A lot of what we say going forward is going to be somewhat negative towards Anthony Pettis, the things that he doesn't do well. Um, even in negative performances, Anthony Pettis performances that don't in which he doesn't look that great. Pettis always has his moments. Um, you and I both thought he beat Eddie Alvarez. Um, yeah, I think we both referred to that as something of a robbery on this show. Like, I, I, I thought that on the rewatch, it was not quite as clear as I thought it was live, but I still think at worst that's a 29-29 draw, if not 29-28 Pettis. Yeah, you and I both thought that he ended up beating Alvarez, um, and it was at the very least a close fight. But we both also agreed it wasn't necessarily a fight that he deserved to win. He came in there faced with a challenge that he has faced many times before and didn't really have that many new ways of answering it. Um, yeah, he, there, were, there were particular challenges in that fight that Pettis did answer. He threw more volume. He was more active when he got to range. But he, like, maybe it's just that he's not very strong and he's really not able to contend with big, powerful guys who want to push him up against the fence. I mean, that's possible. He may just not yeah. have the raw physical strength necessary to compete with guys like I, that. I think there is a bit of that, but I, I also kind of think that Anthony Pettis may have a bit of what we were talking about with Junior Dos Santos a while ago, where he just feels a little too comfortable everywhere. I think Anthony Pettis knows how dangerous he is. Uh, you know, he has seven KOs and eight submissions. The vast majority of his victories are by finish. He's only gone to decision. Uh, he's on to decision seven times, but he's only won three decisions. So he basically knows that if he's going to win the fight, he's going to hurt his opponent or submit them. And I kind of get the feeling that Anthony Pettis does not have a sense of urgency or a sense of um, a strategic intelligence when it, in his fights when it comes to fighting where he is really at his best. So when his opponent is backing him up, I think he starts, he immediately responds to that by thinking, all right, I'm going to try and counter him. And when his opponent is at range, then he does what he's really good at. And when his opponent is wrestling with him, he's thinking like, all right, I'm going to try and drag him to the ground and submit him, or I'm going to hit him with a hard knee in the body or something. He doesn't think, get out of here as quickly as possible. Only close the distance on your own terms. Maintain the center of the octagon as much as possible. You know, he doesn't want to do things that uh, even kind of seem difficult sometimes, I think. Uh, like, he doesn't want to move into his opponent to get his back off the fence. Instead, he just thinks, all right, I'll just stay at a comfortable distance and wait till he ends up getting knocked out. And I think that right there is the real dichotomy in this matchup and the reason I particularly favor Edson Barboza, because I think if there's one thing that Edson Barboza has dramatically improved over the past two years in particular 
it's his cage craft and his his sense of of responsible strategic fighting. Edson Barboza is not content to have his back put on the fence. He is not content to have you walk him down and just play defense. Um, he has much, much better than he ever has been at responding with counters and staying active and making sure to punish you for every single step you take into his range. Pettis was my first favorite fighter. He was the first guy where I, that, that I'm, I started watching him and I'm like, oh my God, I don't know what I'm watching here, but this is awesome and I need to watch more of it. You know, the first like the first fight that I was ever super, super, super into, really incredibly excited about uh, was Henderson. Uh, it was Henderson Pettis one. Yeah, that was that was the moment where I became an MMA super fan. So mm-hmm. like Anthony Pettis, I have always ridden for him. You know, like I have always been there for for Pettis and and still always will be. I will always enjoy him. But it is maddening to watch Anthony Pettis over the years because he has never really gotten better at doing the little things like yeah. that's. That's what is painful about him is we know Anthony Pettis can do the big things. We know he can finish you with a, with a kick at any point in time. We know that he can finish you with a flying knee. We know that he can hit you with a, with a submission out of nowhere. We know that he's incredible in transition. He's an unbelievable scrambler, which is what made him a uniquely difficult matchup for Benson Henderson. Um, everything that Henderson could do, Pettis did better. And if you ran that, if you ran that fight ten times, I think Pettis wins nine of them or nine and a half of them <laughs> even. Like – that's that's just uniquely difficult. But when he's facing a really sound, process-driven fighter, all of that falls apart. Why? Because he loses the little battles. He loses that little that little battle where you're going to have to dig for an underhook against the fence that you're only going to learn by having done that yeah. a bajillion times in practice. He, he loses like, the little battles and he ends up fighting the wrong battles. He, he pours exactly. his energy into the wrong into the wrong skirmishes. Exactly. And so, you know, when he gets backed up against the cage, yeah, sure. I mean, he's lackadaisical about it and he maybe and he maybe thinks, well, I'm going to get him at some point anyway, so it doesn't matter. But it never seems to occur to him that if he just won those little battles, he would have a better chance. He would have more time to do the things that he actually does want to do. Yeah. Like that never really seems to cross his mind. And it's kind of maddening. And like I say this as a guy who loves every big moment of Anthony Pettis's career and thinks like I think he's underrated from like from the perspective of durability. Like I think he's an unbelievably oh, yeah. durable, tough fighter um, who can take you can take a tremendous beating. He can take big shots and kind of walk them off. But I think that tendency plays really poorly for him in this fight like Edson Barbosa as dynamic as he is as powerful as he is with his hands and his kicks uh, as fast as he is Barbosa is an incredibly sound process driven fighter like that dynamism is backed up by the fact that Barbosa is going to win rounds off of you in a way that I don't think that Pettis even at this point even as he's improved some things in his game I don't think that he can yeah there's a there's a, a bit of um a bit of romance to Anthony Pettis when he's winning because of that and even when he's he's losing, there's a bit of a romance to his style because he is this kind of – he's a feaster family. He's a live by the sword, die by the sword kind of fighter. He's like an, uh, like an Anderson Silva where he doesn't have this really sound process to the way that he fights. He is not picking apart all the things you do well or attacking all of your individual weaknesses in an intelligent way. And yet more often than not, he finds the way to win. He finds a way to win the fight. And it's it's kind of magical to watch that process hap- that ha- process happening. I say process; it's not much of a process. It's kind of magical to watch that split second when all of the chemicals interact and the reaction is is explosive and violent. But it's uh, it's not reliable. And I think Anthony Pettis's road is going to continue getting kind of difficult going forward. He's twenty nine years old. Um, he's been doing this quite a while now. He's been fighting since two thousand seven. Not a terribly long time, but. It's uh, coming up on 10 years. So he, he has basically probably already become the fighter he's going to be. And Edson Barboza, I think, has only just become the fighter that he's going to be. I think Edson Barboza's last three or four performances say a lot more about what his future potential is than a lot of the tough fights he had before that, like the Donald Cerrone knockout, the Jamie Varner knockout, the near loss to Danny Castillo. It's really easy to forget because he's been so dangerous and so dynamic since he came into the UFC. But Edson Barboza has only been fighting since April of 2009. Last Sunday was his six-year professional MMA anniversary. And so 
that's about the time I usually expect fighters to start hitting their prime. He's 30 years old, so he's right in the midst of his athletic prime. He's right now starting to get the level of experience that he uh, that he needs. He's not frequently injured. He's got a very good coach who really cares about process and who has gotten better at instilling it in his fighters, in Mark Henry. I think we've seen the similar kind of improvements from Frankie Edgar that we see in Edson Barboza. And even having lost two of his last three, the, the Tony Ferguson and Michael Johnson fights, I thought Barboza comported himself really well in both of those. He dealt with, well, three fighters, actually, and Ferguson, Felder, and Johnson, three fighters who are much more capable of pouring on volume and pressure and cutting off the octagon than Anthony Pettis. Much more consistent in that regard. And even having lost two of those fights, Edson Barboza performed really well, um, didn't have the mental lapses that kind of plagued him earlier in his career, didn't have these weird defensive lapses, didn't allow himself to stay in any disadvantageous positions. Um, and in that Ferguson fight, like, who's to say Edson Barboza wouldn't have won that fight against any fighter with a less granite chin than Tony Ferguson? Because he landed some hellacious counters, all beautifully timed. He was lacing Tony Ferguson's body, was doing really, really well, and then just got finished by one of the most dangerous opportunists in the division, if not the sport as a whole. So... I don't want to look at Anthony Pettis and say, you know, what have you done for me lately? You're on a two-fight losing streak. Now you're going to lose forever. But I, I do think that Edson Barboza is an interestingly difficult matchup for Anthony Pettis. When we look at it, Edson Barboza has done surprisingly well against a slew of difficult pressure fighters. Anthony Pettis did surprisingly poorly against Eddie Alvarez, a not a very dangerous fighter, and surprisingly poorly against Rafa dos Anjos based on our expectations. And how many other really good strikers has Anthony Pettis actually faced uh, in his recent MMA career? Not many. Yeah, I mean, so this might this might sound strange because what has troubled both of these fighters are iron shinned pressure fighters with great cardio. Right. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah. that has been. The, that has been what both guys kryptonite. Barboza is not that. Pettis is not that. Yeah. So it sounds strange to predict that either fighter, or like, it sounds strange, I think, especially for Pettis, because we assume that if you give Pettis a range striking matchup, he's going to win that fight. But I think that there are things about this particular matchup that make it uniquely difficult for Pettis. That Pettis, despite being a great offensive kicker, is not great at defending kicks. He is always there to hit with kicks. Yeah. And do you really want to be eating Edson Barboza switch kicks? To the liver? Do you really want to be eating Edson Barboza low kicks? God forbid. Do you want to deal with his? Do you want to have to deal with his kick counters when you kick at him? Because Barboza is the answer to all of those questions is no. <laughs> In case anyone was wondering what your uh, what your rhetorical questions were, no, I do not want to be kicked by Edson Barboza in any way, shape, or form. And in the meantime, who is a more active, much more dangerous puncher? It's Barboza. Yeah. Like, then Pettis doesn't have the kind of clinch game that could trouble Barboza. He doesn't really, as far as we can tell, have the kind of takedown game that's going to trouble Barboza. Like, this is going to almost certainly play out as a range-striking matchup in the middle of the cage at a distance that both fighters are comfortable with. And in that matchup, as strange as it sounds, I prefer Barboza. He's just a little more consistent. And Anthony Pettis kind of has the uh, Henry Cejudo thing going on. Like, he's really good when he can string those offensive techniques together. He can work one thread off of another beautifully. Um, and that's true when his submission grappling as well as in his striking. But Edson Barboza is just a little better at process. We've used that word a lot in a very short frame of time. But I think Mark Henry as a coach is really good at instilling this idea that one thing always leads to another, whether it's defense to offense, and that all of these things have to fit into a specific strategic framework that you don't engage in battles that don't make sense for you to engage in. You don't stand in positions that don't put you at an advantage. You always ensure position before attack. You hear that a lot from submission grapplers. They say position before submission, but the same is true in striking and in all forms of uh, combat sports uh, of fighting. Position before attack. You secure your position, you make sure you have the higher ground, and then you attack. And Edson Barbosa does that more consistently than Anthony Pettis. And I think he is um, more capable of coming in with a strict game plan and sticking to it than Pettis is for him. So... Interesting fight. Anthony Pettis, you cannot count him out. Uh, he is, like I said, the romance of Anthony Pettis, that he can put anybody away, whether on the ground or with a strike. Edson Barboza, not known for his durability, um, has been finished by big single strikes. And Anthony Pettis may not be the most powerful hitter in this division, but he can certainly crack, and he's very accurate. So 
we've definitely seen him hurt some durable fighters in the past. Uh, and I do think this fight is very close and deserves to have very close odds. But uh, I think we made a fairly good case for Edson Barboza, and I am excited to see if he can pull it off. Um, very quickly before we wrap up, let's just give a few words on the middleweight matchup between Robert Whitaker and Rafael Natal. I'm a big fan of Rafael Natal. Pat, you recently said I have weird taste in fighters, and I suspect this is another example of that. Yeah, this is going to be like <laughs> Exhibit Z in that particular conversation. But, but yeah, no, I'm there. No, I, Rafael Natal deserves a lot of credit for coming into the UFC as effectively a one-dimensional top position grappler who didn't even have a terribly diverse grappling game. That was what he was really good at. He was a decent wrestler, and he has now become a solid all-around fighter yeah. with good cardio who hits hard who's durable, he's willing to mix it up and get in there, um, who makes, who, again, he is a fighter who is worth more than the sum of his parts. He, he's like, a very poor man's Fabricio Verdum. Yeah, very, very, I mean, homeless <laughs> man's Fabricio Verdum. But, <laughs> he's, uh, no, he's, he, he's a mean dude, is Rafael on the tall yeah. when he's in there in the cage fighting, and he's got swagger and charisma, um, and he's got, and he doesn't have an ounce of fear. And yeah. he has managed to parlay that, into beating some guys that he shouldn't have beaten, like Uriah Hall, some guys who don't do the little things well. Rafael Natal does the little things well. Um, and he's put on some really credible performances against some really tough fighters. Like, Tom Watson doesn't have the shiniest record, but Tom Watson's a, re a really reliable test for middleweight fighters, and Rafael Natal had his way with Tom Watson when they fought. Beat the crap out of him. Yeah. Absolutely it, beat him up. Yeah, artfully so. You know, he kind of made fun of him while he was doing it. He really made it look easy. So that's I like Rafael Natal. I like these fighters who are kind of disadvantaged in terms of the, the, the physical lottery and yet who find ways to win. I, I like – it's yeah. the journeyman ethic that I really admire. You, Connor Rebush is home for uh, for wayward middleweights. <laughs> that's, that's basically what we're talking about here. Right. You, this is why uh, I like the middleweight division. It's chock full of guys like Rafael Natal. Uh, I say that with love, but <laughs> but yeah. So Robert Whitaker is the is the A side of this matchup. Like this is pretty yeah. clearly a test to see can Whitaker deal with the kinds of uh, tough, uh, durable, uh, mean, well rounded guys he's going to see in the top eight or so of the middleweight division. Not Natal is is very clearly there. Joe Silva has put him there to see if Whitaker can deal with that. If he has dealt with some of the issues that plagued him earlier in his career. Um, and I think that, that Whitaker is going to pass this test with flying colors. I am very high on Whitaker as an undersized middleweight with great size or with great speed, big power, a really sound underlying process in terms of the way that he puts his strikes together. Um, really diverse game, good counter puncher. I like pretty much everything about Robert Whitaker as a fighter. Yeah, he, he was in that awkward position where he really did seem too small for the middleweight division. He's pretty thickly built, but he he did seem like he was probably best, would have the most advantages at welterweight. And yet, since moving to middleweight, he has seemed just as, if not more powerful. He has seemed less worried about expending too much energy. He basically seems tireless now at middleweight. He can throw as much power as he wants, as often as he wants. And he has seemed perhaps a little more durable. And he has retained the speed that made him an effective welterweight, especially against the larger middleweights who aren't as quick. Um, he was even faster, I think, than Uriah Hall, which, who was one of the fastest middleweights out there. So... Uh, yeah, I think Robert Whitaker has a ton of built-in advantages going for him in this division. And I think he is also sort of adding depth to his game um, in a few very crafty, very clever ways. Obviously, he's well-known for his boxing. Uh, he's got a dynamite left hook, really nice straight right hand. Tends to get a little wild, sometimes winging those punches. But at the very least, he moves his head offline and is cognizant of when his opponent is in position to counter him and when he's not. So he's not usually uh, at, at as at risk as he sometimes seems. But he has added a pretty impressive complement of kicks to that, both the front kicks to kind of distract and disguise the punches and some good thudding low kicks that... Um, kind of dissuade his opponent from countering him, add some variety to his game. And I think he the, one of the most impressive aspects of that Uriah Hall fight, which was just a great fight overall, um, is how good Robert Whitaker looked on the ground. Um, I think he had as much success there uh, on top of Uriah Hall as Gegard Mousasi did. And Gegard Mousasi has been doing this jiu-jitsu thing for a long time. I think Robert Whitaker is only a purple belt in jiu-jitsu, but he had some really, really good top control, excellent ways of of clearing your eye hall's feet 
um, getting on top of a longer guy who, who might have some advantages from that position, landing his shots and controlling him at the same time, and even threaten to rear naked choke. So I think he's proven himself to be a really well-rounded and, and dangerous middleweight, and I, I do think he's going to prove too much for my boy Rafael Natal. Yeah, so believe it or not, as far as Whitaker's striking game is concerned, he was actually originally a karate practitioner as a kid. Oh. Um, and he has only added the boxing since. Like, he got really into boxing apparently late in his teens, but, but first came the karate, which is why in his early MMA fights, you used to see a lot, of, a lot more blitzing. Um, yeah, sure, he used yeah. To throw, yeah, he used to throw a lot of blitzing combinations. Less so now. I mean, he can still bust them out when he wants to. He's now much more of a, uh, much more of a uh, small increments of distance, uh, good, good tight angles and pivots kind of guy. But, yeah, you used to see that a lot from him. Yeah. Yeah, uh, so I'm pretty high on him as well. I'm excited to see him perform. But I guess that wraps up our discussion of UFC 197 and just about wraps up episode 100 of Heavy Hands. Before we go, uh, Pat, you had a couple things you wanted to tell the people about? Yeah, so um, I've got my usual preview coming out on Bleacher Report, and then I'll have another piece on Bleacher Report later this week, uh, probably about Demetrius Johnson and Demetrius Johnson as a pound-for-pound great. But I will also be making my debut for the Washington Post. I'll be writing a piece about John Jones and range. So look for that on Thursday. Washington uh, also, Post. For, I'm sorry? Washington Post, print media. Yeah. You're moving, yeah. moving up into a... Well, I, I don't, I don't want to say a dying art form, but still one that is more prestigious than the interwebs. So congratulations to you, man. Thank you. It is a newspaper of record. It's true. Uh, so, yeah. so there we go. But also, I passed my dissertation defense, so I will be uh, Dr. Wyman very soon. Soon it will be heavy hands with Connor Rebush and Dr. Patrick Wyman. Yeah, I'm going to make you say that every time. I'm going to say I'm No, you're going to get sick of me <laughs> saying it. I'm going to say it way more than you want me to. Uh, so congratulations, Pat's moving on to big things. Um, what do I have to brag about? I successfully paid my taxes. Today. That is huge, bro. That is huge. <laughs> that is a, like, you know how many people fuck that up every year? Like, yeah, that's getting true. that done and getting it done oh. right is a massive accomplishment. Well, I appreciate that. Thank you very much, Dr. Wyman. Um, <laughs> Oh, what are you working on this week, Connor? Well, uh, I have a video coming out on – I'm going to talk about Jones and Johnson as pound-for-pound pound greats. Uh, just a little bit one – little one of those preview videos. Uh, I will have my Sherdog, my full Sherdog preview of UFC 197. That's already done and in the hopper, ready to go probably Wednesday or Thursday. Um, and then I'm hoping to do two articles this week. I want to talk about John Jones' ground and pound. I was really looking forward to doing a pair of joint articles, like a, a, a Gaps in the Armor piece, both for John Jones and for Daniel Cormier, how to beat the champion and how to beat the number one. But uh, that's not happening. So instead, I'm going to talk about John Jones, probably talk about his ground and pound or his transitional fighting in the clinch with his wrestling and striking combined. His hand fighting and his co- boxing combined is really fun. And then I'll probably do something on Demetrius Johnson, maybe a gaps in the armor and talk about how Henry Cejudo can beat him or something. Or maybe Anthony Pettis, Edson Barboza, because I'm really excited about that one. We'll see. Obviously, you have your shit together, Pat, and I am fumbling around in the dark over here. But there will be some exciting stuff coming out later this week. Well, this is going to be a, this is a good week for fights. I'm stoked about these. I'm going to be really excited to break them down uh, to break down what happens next week. Same here. Yeah. Congratulations to you again, Pat. Thank you for joining me today for this discussion. It was stimulating and very fun. And thank you to everyone at home uh, for joining us as well. We hope you enjoyed today's episode. If you came here today for the finer points of face punching, you came to the right place. This has been episode 100 of Heavy Hands.